Hello and welcome to coverage of Grand Prix Las Vegas. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe. I'm in the booth with William Huey Jensen. We've got Paul Hare versus Andrew Cuneo. Black green for Andrew Cuneo versus blue red for Paul Hare. So this was the deck that seemed to be flowing, at least just anecdotally. We saw. Uh, I'm not sure. Paul's position at the table. I though. don't know either, yeah. so it's hard to say which one of the cards that he got as they were coming around. But, you know, we saw some hieroglyphic illuminations late. We did see a couple of red burn spells go through Andrew. And uh, looks like we're going to be underway here. Andrew, as the number four seed is on the play, how many looks cards like does he, he have in his hand? Yeah, yeah he, he molded to six. Let's see what Paul's working with here. He's going to kick things off with an island. Andrew has the one drop. It's a festering mummy. He chips in. For one point of damage, does he have a land and a two? No, he has a land but not the two. Passes a turn back. That's a swamp. I don't know if he has a forest. Yep, there's he one does. The He does, he does, yep. And getting to three is going to be really important for Andrew because he's got a lot of cursed minotaurs. In fact, I think he drafted five of them. Paul lining up a tormenting voice. Really strong play out of the blue-red deck. Can get one or two spells in the graveyard right away. For cards like uh, Enigma Drake or Warfire Javelinier or okay. Cryptic Serpent. So I'm taking a look at Paul's list since we have so much less information about what he's got going on. He has three Cryptic Serpent, three Hecma Sentinels in his deck. Now on the red side of things, he's got some really interesting stuff here. Okay. Okay, so first off, he has the Sweltering Suns, okay, which is going to be really good against Andrew if he can draw it. Uh, he's also got a Warfire Javelin here, which is a payoff for this type of deck, one of the key cards uh, in that way. Looked like he had a Deem Worthy in his hand. He does have a Deem Worthy in the deck, so yes, you did see that correctly, and this is really interesting. He's playing, he's drafted two Blazing Volley, and he's playing both. Interesting. In the main. Which is not common. You, you don't see that very often. Does he often. have Soul Scar Mage? Uh, let me look. He's got an Edifice of Authority, and where are the gold cards here? Multicolored. No Enigma Drakes. I was right. asking about Soul Scar Mage, because that's a yeah. reasonable combo, that's a combo with the Blazing Volley. For sure. I think probably seeing something like two Blazing Volleys in a deck in this draft doesn't surprise me. I think it just goes to what we were talking about, just a weak overall card pool, and you got to fill out the deck. Totally. You, you see the uh, Tormenting Voice that he played as well. In the meantime, Andrew uses one of his combat tricks. Is that a Heart Pierce Manticore? shed weakness to get through. I did not see that. Yeah, it is. He That's does a have a hard period. Sorry, I just missed that. He did pick up one Magma Spray as well, by the way. Zero Electrify, though. Ops to do nothing. Maybe maybe planning to cast something like Hieroglyphic Illumination. Unfortunately for Andrew, I think he's just completely out of gas. I think he's got at least another Forest in his hand, but I think I might have seen an Oracle's Vault. Let me see if Andrew main decked it. Yep, oh, he did. Yeah. <laughs> just check oh, the yeah. list. <laughs> And Andrew's ready to start garnering value here. This could really throw a wrench into the works of Paul Hare's plan. He's going to cycle a sensor. Not exactly a thrilling play. Wow, that's all he did for the turn. So what he was trying to do was get value off of sensor rather than play a four drop, and it didn't work. But getting that sensor in the graveyard clears the way for this cryptic serpent to come down on turn five. So a six five for five mana, good value there for Paul. And it's going to stop the assault from Andrew Cooney, at least temporarily. Brick counters, aisle three. Yeah, I'll take one, please. Pretty typical to activate this right now if you don't have another play and see what you get, because you can hit a land, play it, or maybe some type of spell. All right, Andrew's going to attack with his 3-4. Supernatural stamina would be nice. <laughs> it looks like he's going to try to hit it before damage. He's got a lot of combat tricks. This actually makes sense. And it's a swamp. So he's just going to hit him for three. But Paul did not block. I think he wants to have his Deem Worthy available to try to get Andrew if he attacks into that Serpent again. Yeah, so there's so many combat tricks in Andrew's deck. He just did it before damage. So if he hit a card like yeah. Supernatural Stamina, it wouldn't go to waste. Yeah, it's great. Not typical, but great. 
Now let's see what Paul wants to do, because this part gets pretty interesting. He has that deem worthy. He's going to jam for six. Six is a lot. Yeah. Does he have a, a follow-up threat, or is he going to stay a little bit more on the uh, defensive? Five mana. Oh, my goodness. Another Cryptic Serpent. By the way, that those are two of his three copies of Cryptic Serpent in the deck. Andrew drew a Supernatural Stamina. Well, he, if he was bluffing before, he might as well do it again now that he has it. He's going to go ahead and do a pre-combat now. Is that a synchronized striker or a colossal speed? Okay, he can actually play it. Though by doing this, it means he will not be attacking this turn. Steam Worthy is going to make things awfully tough for Andrew. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny, somehow the blue red deck is just out beefing the black green deck this game. Two six fives for five, making the uh, Colossipede look a little meager. But like you said, the Deemworthy clearing away the Colossipede and clearing the way for, for 12 full damage. And if Andrew does not block here, he's just going to lose to the Heartpiercer Manticore. And even if he does block here, he might lose to it. So he's going to go ahead and chump with the Festering Mummy and put a counter on one of them. He I'm still takes sure. six here, though. I'm not sure if I love this play from Andrew. Explain. Um, so my problem here is this game is so far out of reach. Mm -hmm. Like, I think he, Andrew might f is so unlikely to win that he might have just been best to try to draw or hit off uh, the Oracle's Vault to synchronize strike. Oh. oh, which is what he hit! Because that would be lethal if Paul didn't have anything. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten with the supernatural stamina. Paul could have had something. I, I can't exactly see what's in Andrew's hand, but it feels to me like Andrew's far behind. Oh, Huey. Why'd you have to say that? You're so That's right. My job. You're so <laughs> right about that. And it looks like Andrew's thinking about it now. I only look right because it happened. No, that is not how that works. You were right whether it happened or not. Brutal. Now how the heck is Andrew going to win this game? Well, probably starts... It's going to be hard. It, it's going to involve hitting... Never return. But does he have a, a play another blocker here? That I don't know. Maybe a curse minotaur? No, he's got another ornery kudu. The problem is is that the the heart piercer manticore just represents such a beating. That it basically makes it but there's virtually no possible for Kunio to jump double both. chump here, right? Yeah. Like and even if he does, he's not winning the game. Right. So likely he will block the biggest serpent with the smallest kudu, go to three, and then just lose. So Paul has a magma spray in his hand. I don't know if he just drew it. Probably did. In the event he didn't, though, my play wouldn't have worked. I mean, that's not a comment on its correctness, though, right? No. It's just a what just would have happened comment. thing? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, Andrew's going to go for the double block to leave himself with just the 2-3, but get rid of one of the serpents. But now we're going to see the Manticore throw the other serpent right at Andrew's face, and that's game one going to Paul here. Crazy stuff. No wiggle room whatsoever for Andrew Cuneo. No. And a nice one there for Paul here with the two copies of Cryptic Serpent really just taking over the board once he hit his fifth mana. Sideboards are being consulted. And I think they're going to... Yeah, there we go. I was just going to say that. They're going to get deck lists. That's Nicolette giving them 
their lists. And this, of course, changes everything. This isn't, you don't normally get this if you're just playing a, a, around at a GP. No, but the problem is in the top eight, what happens is, you know, we show Andrew's draft on camera. Mm. In this case, it's Andrew. So if, you know, if Paul Hare has a friend watching the draft, he gets to tell Paul what legally the co complete contents of Andrew's deck. To, so, so prevent, so to prevent being featured, being a major disadvantage, causing people to not want to do it, they just give deck lists yeah. to, to even the playing field. Yeah, it's just only fair to Andrew. It does change things significantly when it comes to sideboarding, though, does it not? Yeah, I would say the biggest change is in gameplay. W knowing what to play around. Right, mm -hmm. like knowing all your opponent's combat tricks, all your opponent's bomb rares. Like, you know, obviously it doesn't necessarily change your sideboarding if I know you have Wrath of God in your limited deck, but it definitely changes the way I play a game. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you know, most of the commons in the set, the pro-level players are already going to be fully aware of and considering when they make their their attacks, their blocks, their plays. But when it comes to some of the uncommons, you know, a good example would be a card like Synchronized Strike, like knowing that your opponent has one of those in their deck versus maybe playing around it is such a difference if you've just seen the list. Right. And rares, of course, count for that as well. You know, one of the cards that was in uh, well, that was in this draft was there was a rags to riches going around, and you know, depending on the matchup, that certainly matters. Like you said, for the gameplay, if you know that your opponent has that. Looks like Andrew is changing out a few cards here. He took out. Festering Goblin, is that what it's called these Festering days? Mummy. Festering Mummy. It's a little and, different. And Relentless Sniper. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't really... <laughs> I, like, I like this. Festering Goblin and Relentless Sniper. <laughs> What's the sniper called? Toothless. Oh, okay. I like it, though. All right. I tried. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're good, buddy. So, uh, <laughs> it's, been, it's been a really long day. <laughs> so, yeah. He, he doesn't feel like the minus one, minus one counters. One here and one there are going to match yeah. up that great against three six fives probably. Yeah, that makes sense. And I mean, that's really what Paul's deck's trying to do. Yeah, you use, can tell that use, that's what it's built around. You know, I, I would say for sure the most important card for Andrew to know about here is is um, Sweltering Suns. Yes, absolutely. That's a huge one against him. And on the flip side, Paul gets to know about Synchronized Strike, even though he saw it. But curious if Paul leaves in the Blazing Volleys. It seems pretty bad against Andrew. And, for example, Paul has three copies of Naga Oracle. He's only played one. But those two fours, they block pretty well. They can gang up on a... Maybe he just wants Blazing Volley to be like a Llanowar Elf. He has so many of the uh, <laughs> so many of the Serpents, you know? Yeah. Andrew ended up playing 16 lands in his deck. It's pretty common. Yeah, I, I thought that might happen. Yeah, all in all, this matchup doesn't look amazing for Andrew, but it's certainly winnable. But if I were just to look at the two decks, I would give the edge to Paul. Paul has some really powerful tools to yep. deal with uh, Andrew's game plan. Sweltering Suns, like you said, kind of headliner. Yeah, just a complete bomb rare in this format. Yeah. It... it Especially the way the format's played out. It just sweeps away so many of the cards you really care about. And in Paul's deck, it's extra good because he can back it up with some Serpents that, that clean up the game very quickly as well. All right, we're underway here in game number two. Andrew Cunio plays a Swamp. Island for Paul. Yeah, Andrew has a lot of uh -oh. three drops and not uh, a third land. Uh, yep, no third land and no Hapatra. We have not seen that on the second turn of the game yet. What does Paul have? He's going to pass the turn back. Andrew undoubtedly will be thinking 
about sensor though in this case it's not going to matter paul immediately draws a card maybe he doesn't have a sensor thinks andrew but he does have a three mana play it's going to be a vizier of tumbling sands which is really going to put paul ahead on mana if andrew cannot find himself a land and ah he did not supernatural stamina off the top and andrew cuneo might be in not like this territory pretty quickly if paul can keep this up This is the quarterfinals here in Las Vegas of the limited portion of our GP schedule. And Andrew's going to discard a Cursed Minotaur to hand size. This is not going well for Cuneo. Paul's just going to go ahead and attack for one, dropping Andrew down to 19. And what does Paul have as his follow-up play? He wants to get as much power on the board as quickly as possible. Sammy P. And he has it. Heart Piercer, Manticore. He's now got five power on the battlefield. Andrew does draw a forest, though, so a glimmer. And he's got another Cursed Minotaur. Andrew ended up with five Cursed Minotaur. He's playing all of them. In some ways, his deck is built around it <coughs> with combat tricks. Wow, but there is a Magma Spray from Paul, and he even has a four drop to back it up. And... It's an Avon initiate. This is not how Andrew Cunio drew it up, and this one could be very quick in favor of Paul here. After Andrew missed a land drop, he is only going to be able to play one card per turn, and he's so far behind at this point. Yeah, Andrew's deck is borderline incapable of winning from this position, unfortunately. Yeah, it definitely feels like it. Like, his deck is not a deck that wants to play from behind. I mean, no deck loves to miss land drops, but the aggressive decks, you know, Somewhat aggressive decks with good two drops. Don't draw two drops. Don't play a land on the third turn and discard the hand size. It's just not. Yeah. Andrew's looking at his hand like, can I afford to not block and try to leave up one of these combat tricks? And the answer is no. No, you can't. So his graveyard is just full of cursed minotaurs. He's got one exiled, two yeah. in the yard. And is this going to be a serpent? Yeah, it's tough, too, because, I mean, blocking Jeez. that hard pierce manacore, if, if Paul wants, he just gets to return it to the battlefield right away with bomb. even as just a 4-3. Sure. Another land off the top for Cuneo, but it's going to be too little, too late here. Unless he catches some miraculous breaks in the next couple of turns. Even just the even initiate the even in, yeah. is good enough. Andrew's trying to figure out any possible way out of this mess. Paul Hare's deck running like a well-oiled machine here. Removal spell for your three drop. Cast of Manticore, attack you. Andrew's deep in the tank here. He knows he has no wiggle room whatsoever here. So he's going to play an Ornery Kudu and presumably leave up a Shed Weakness with that green mana. Paul draws his card for the turn. He's on the verge of defeating Andrew. He just needs to finish him off. And winds of rebuke. Andrew just cannot buy a bucket here. Paul has it all. Paul needs to, or both players, need to mill two cards. Yes, right? they do need to mill two cards. And Andrew says, hey, hey, we didn't do that. It's part of the spell resolving. Looks like there's talking to the judge and saying, well, hey, we didn't mill. Just do it now. Okay. But in the meantime, Andrew Cuneo down to two. One, two, three, four, five, six. Throw something at you, and that's going to do it. Paul Hare advances to the semifinals in two quick games over the pro. Andrew Cuneo, congratulations, Paul. Well done. His deck looked fantastic. Yeah, good deck. I mean, 